So people showed up. Now I don't know what to do. No, welcome to um, my panel on video game psychology and you get the actual facts. Um, my name is Amanda Spickle, but you might know me as the Omega Geek from Psych Media. I come to you courtesy of the Doctoral College at Ulster University. Um, so it's kind of official. But so today we're going to be talking a little teeny bit about um, video game psychology. That's no good. So, I like that. Perfect. So we're going to be talking a little bit about gaming effects, and the air quotes are on purpose because we're going to be talking about the effects that people have claimed in scientific studies are the result of video game use. We're going to be talking how to critically evaluate gaming research, and then I want to go into some actually really cool gaming research that I've been seeing coming across my dashboard. So I want to let you know that um, I hold a BSc, a Bachelor's in Psychology, and I'm working towards my PhD. I am not a clinician. I cannot diagnose or assess or... So we can't talk about anyone's problems today because that has come up in the past before. And we'll have a short conclusion in my references and questions. And all that kind of stuff. Okay, so once upon a time in 1994, and I know some of you, uh, it, it might be a bit of a stretch, you might have been fetuses then, but trust me, this was a time that did exist. I was 14, and I was sitting at the dining room table on my birthday, and my parents said, close your eyes, and I did. And then they said, okay, open your eyes. And when I opened my eyes, there was a brand new box on the table, it was Doom 2. And my dad said, you know what, you love the shareware version so much, we thought we'd get you doomed too. And I said, you're psychologists. Because they are, my, my parents are clinicians. I said, I said, yeah, I said, this is violent video games. It was just on the news the other night. This is, are, are you sure that you want me to have this? Now, this was before a lot of the spree shooting culture of the States. And my dad looked at me and said, well, are you gonna go shoot up the post office? And I said no, and he goes, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> so a little teeny bit of history. In 1971, the first arcade game is released. This is not the first video game, this is the first home arcade game. And in 1976, the first game was pulled from the shelves. It was called Death Race. And I've got a little teeny screenshot right there. And you have a weak car, and you ride around for reasons unknown, and you hit gremlins. When you hit the gremlins, it goes, bang. Well, that's what YouTube said the noise was. And then a little teeny gravestone comes up, and people lost their minds. They were so concerned about this that the game was pulled from the show. There was, there was a moral outcry. 1993 is kind of the next big moment in gaming censorship, and I hate to call it censorship because that's such a loaded word right now, but it really was an examination of violent video games and youth culture, and Mortal Kombat and Doom were discussed in Congress and committee, and I love when pop culture is discussed in Congress because then it has to get entered into congressional record. So I really want some historians hundreds of years from now speaking about the American culture, and this one document will be in textbooks, and people have to do exams about the fact that, get over here, was entered into congressional record. <laughs> uh, which led to, in 1994, the Entertainment Software Rating Board, or the ESRB. And if any, has anyone here seen this movie is not yet rated? Oh, not that. If you haven't, it's a fantastic documentary about um, the way that we, we rate movies, and the ESRB does work kind of in a, in a similar kind of manner, but we, we put together these, these kinds of, I don't want to say legislative bodies because they're not, the ESRB doesn't really hold any kind of legislative power, as kind of a way to say, this is good, this is not, a child should see this, a child shouldn't see that, and a lot of those rulings are quite subjective. And we'll be getting to more of that. So this is just a bit of history. This came courtesy from the National Coalition Against Censorship's website. Um, so gaming and gaming technology are not the first things that we've been scared of. So I wanted to get a little collection of things that people thought would end society. First one being the steam locomotive. People actually thought when the first passenger trains were introduced, if you went over 30 miles an hour, you would suffer speed psychosis. 
your mind would not be able to reconcile the fact that you were going so fast and it would drive you insane. They thought the same thing about the bicycle. Apparently doctors were warning in Victorian London about bicycle face, which was an unfortunate malady that could happen to young women. Even more unfortunate things could happen to young women if they didn't ride side saddle. And as you see, the young woman there is not having any of your nonsense. And people had a lot, oh, there were so many crazy conspiracy theories about what would happen if you used the telephone. But I picked this illustration because look at your man right there. He's like, huh, honey? Isn't that cute? Just like that. Like, I remember being told as a child in, in the, in the mid-80s, don't use the telephone during a thunderstorm. You'll get electrocuted and die. People, people thought that the, the wires could be hijacked, that their secret conversations with other people would be overheard, that their brains, again, would not be able to reconcile the idea that they were hearing a voice without seeing someone there. They'd be driven insane. So the idea that new technology is inherently dangerous is not new at all. So a lot of fear went into this, the idea that video games will somehow cause harm, but it's always in these really, really, really vague mechanisms. Obviously, if you play with matches, you will cause yourself harm, and it's pretty obvious how you'll be burnt with flames. But there's this idea that somehow, some process, some invisible process will cause you harm through video game use. And when I was a kid, it was always the friend of a friend. Oh, well, you know, you know, my hairdresser's cousin, you know what happened to her wee boy? Well, he was playing Pong and he went blind. And it is kind of like an urban legend. It's kind of like something that you hear passed along. Oh, well, you know, I was at summer camp and a, and a kid from New Jersey told me this. And th there's no kid from New Jersey. It, it never actually happened. But it's new and scary. And because we don't really understand how it works, we get afraid of it. And it is a very generational thing. If, if I take my smartphone and I want to show my mother a uh, picture and my parents, they're, you know, they're baby boomers, they're, they're in their early 70s now, my mom will, will take the phone as though I've handed her a live grenade. Oh, okay, okay, honey, I just, oh, oh, so, uh, here, here. And I was like, it, it's got a cover, it's got a case. You, if, if you drop it on the carpet, it's going to be fine. But it's because it's not the technology that she's used to. It's kind of a little bit unnerving, it's a little bit scary. It leads to the moral panic idea, won't someone think of the children? And this is one of my favorite points about tech fear, uh, because I saw a really great YouTube video several years ago, and it was called, My Toddler Thinks a Magazine is a Broken Tablet. And it was a wee two-year-old. It was so cute on the tablet with an issue of Cosmo Magazine, you know, flicking and pinching and making it bigger and smaller. And then it faded out, same toddler, and the mom kind of hands her a, a, a physical issue of Cosmo, and she tries to swipe, and she goes, oh no. And that's so brilliant, because I see, I see people in my field, I see psychologists, older and, and with more experience than me, you know, kind of taking a moral panic edge, kind of saying, what is screen time doing to our children's brains? Well, it's adapting our children's brains. I gotta confess to you, I, it took a lot of work the past year or so for me to learn to type with my thumbs on a smartphone. Something that I see kids, I saw a kid out there queuing for opening ceremonies. And I'm like, I wish I could do that. But his brain has been adapted to this technology. And there's this, it, it comes into what's called the naturalistic fallacy. The idea if something isn't natural, if something isn't homegrown, if something isn't organic, it's somehow ruining us or ruining our evolution. Now, I, I'm an evolutionary psychologist, so a lot of the stuff that I do comes with that, that viewpoint of, well, there was a time when we couldn't even make fire. We now control a robot on Mars. I think we're doing pretty well as a species. Technology hasn't ruined us yet. And the naturalistic fallacy can be very, very dangerous, especially when it comes to, to technology. I was, I was having a conversation once with a friend of mine from university, and I was telling a story about when I was in high school, we came into science class and we had a pressurized system with a tank of hydrogen and a tank of oxygen and an empty tank in the middle, and the teacher depressurized the system, they combined, they made water in the middle, he opened the spigot and we could drink the water. And the point of the story was that I was so simple, this is all I talked about for like three days. This was the coolest thing. We made water, you guys, oh my god, this was so cool. And my friend looked at me and she goes, I can't believe you did that. I was like, I know, right? What a loser. 
And she's like, no, I can't believe you drank lab-created water. It's not natural. It didn't come from God. It didn't come from nature. You could get cancer. And I looked at her, and I, and I really wanted to say, look, let's, let's review. You know what makes up water, right? You know it's hydrogen and the oxygen, right? And she goes, yeah, but, but I don't know. It, can't, can't, it was made in a lab. <laughs> High school science classroom. And I said, well, you drink beer, right? And she goes, well, of course. I said, well, it's just distilled water. That's what they make beer out of. Oh, I don't know, but it's not natural. So this, this idea that there's a specific way that we have to be, that if we're not involving nuts and stones and berries, we're ruining the species, is so, so, so dangerous because that outlook kind of limits what we're able to do with technology. Okay, so I want to let you guys know that for this slide, I did a keyword search on child video game reactions. And I ended up with a lot of great stock pictures and for some reason the angry video game nerd. But my design schema for, you know, for, for the outlook of, of the slide looked just so good with like his picture right in there. It fit perfectly, so, so there you go. So um, take a look at these pictures. Like I said, these are all stock images on a simple uh, keyword search in, uh, in Google Images. And what do you notice about all these pictures? Except James Rolfe, obviously. Right. They are all white. What else? Violence. Right. They're all they're all you know portraying aggression. They're all yeah. They're all boys. They're all wee boys. Yeah. Uh, most of them are wearing red. This one's cheating. Those are two different children. I noticed that. But I thought, and, and I don't know what's going on with your man in the corner. He's kind of like, oh no. <laughs> I lost my eBay auction. He's not. He's not really committed to the to the stock photo. But. This is really, really interesting because it's this idea that our children are being corrupted, but our, at least what you know, stock photos believe, our idea of our children are lovely, sweet little white boys. I didn't see any people of color. I didn't find, I had to scroll, scroll way down to find a girl crying with a controller in her hand. And then I hit the link and it was selling third party controllers. That's the stock image that they were using. And I really love the illustration in the corner because it looks like he's got not even a Nintendo light gun. It looks like he's got one of the ones from like you know an arcade cabinet hooked up to a GameCube. <laughs> he is that's obviously a CRT TV because the glass is shattered, but it's built like a flat screen. He's got um, he's, it looks like he must have a Bluetooth um, headset because he doesn't have any wires, but. I don't know any GameCube that uses Bluetooth headsets to communicate, and uh, a Bowie knife, apparently. But it was just so ridiculous and so perfect that I had to include it. This idea that this, this thing, this, this thing that we don't understand is gonna get into our children's brains and ruin them, make them aggressive, make them everything that we don't want our sweet little good white boys to be. <laughs> Okay, so a lot of these initial studies use the general aggression model. And I know that, um, now this is taken from the paper, and I know it's kind of hard to see, but that's not important because it goes into a lot of serious jargon. The general aggression model is not intended for video game research. Um, it existed quite prior to that. It's one of those models that you can, um, you can use in a lot of places in, in intergroup conflict and in interpersonal conflict. But it's this idea that we get into a way that it creates cognitive scripts of aggression. Like if someone were to come up to me with specific body language, saying specific things, I would be getting ready for an aggressive confrontation. That when we go through these scripts in our mind, we are rehearsing these aggressive acts. That we might, we might interpret other people's body language or anything they say as, being, as having hostile intentions. And that would increase our overall aggression and it would lead to something called hostile attribution bias. You know, you everyone knows someone who walks around with a chip on their shoulder. You're like, hey, Paul, what's the crack? He's like, oh, what do you mean by that? We would say that he would have some hostile attribution bias. So the idea is that if you're coming at everything, even positive or neutral stimuli, as though it's hostile against you, you're going to be more aggressive. And then other people are going to react aggressively to you. And it's going to be kind of a chain reaction. And then one day, we missed the forest for the trees. Now, I had graduated from high school the year before Columbine, and um, my dad was giving me a ride home from work. Uh, we were listening to uh, KYW, AM News Radio in uh, Philadelphia, and there's the Columbine shooting. And I kind of feel like it was maybe a mini 9-11, that kind of thing that maybe changed a lot of stuff. 
because what you heard about violence in video games before that and what you heard about after Columbine kind of changed everything. And it was one of those things where it just became very easy to say, oh, well, you know them, they played a lot of Doom, they played a lot of, now they played a lot of Counter-Strike, you know, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare. I don't play a lot of shooters, so I don't know what they are. But you know what I mean. Even when the shooters aren't gamers, it's just one of those things, and you, everyone's got a relative or a great uncle or someone that you know is like, well, you know, them kids and them buying a video game, I don't know what the world's coming up. And that's another form of that generation gap. I don't understand this, and it scares me. People who are younger than me, I don't understand them, and they scare me. I don't know what my place is here, but I feel that this thing might be bad. So humans, we love us some simplicity. And when you can make a scapegoat out of something, you avoid more complex issues. Not everything is cut and dry. In fact, most things aren't cut and dry. In the social sciences, when we do a study, we're examining a variable that's so, so, so small. We're drilling down to just one aspect of one thing. And you have to kind of control out all the other variables that factor into that. And we're gonna, when we talk about um, critical evaluation, we're gonna look at that, the idea that the social sciences will say, We've found a result, and everyone will rush and say, oh, this is going to solve all of our problems. This means everything. And I, I see you shaking your head. No, 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 it's not the way. Again, it introduces that generation gap, the naturalistic fallacy. You know, my generation didn't do this. We didn't have spree shooters. And actually, um, the, uh, the first mass casualty at a school uh, that happened in the 1930s, and it was uh, someone who was disgruntled about um, town policies and he planted a bomb at the local elementary school and it killed a lot of people. Um, to, it became, it, it was world news to the point that um, Adolf Hitler uh, made a speech about, you know, showing, oh, it's so terrible what's happened in America, to put that in kind of perspective. So the idea that someone would go to a school and take the lives of many children, that was, that existed a long time before video games. A knee-jerk moral panic is easier. Say, that's it, we're going to ban it. This is evil, we're, we're going to ban it. You saw this a lot uh, during the 80s, the D&D &D satanic panic. You know, the idea that anything that we don't understand, this is bad, this is evil. We don't say it's satanic anymore because we're not, hopefully we're getting away from the idea that if something bad happens, Satan was twisting his mustache somewhere. But scapegoat stories have a lasting impact. So raise your hands if you're familiar with the urban legend of the hook. Right. Sounds familiar? So the hook, you have the, your woman and your man, they're, they're young teens, shouldn't be out this late, but they are. In his car they go to Lover's Lookout, and you know what happens at Lover's Lookout. And the girl hears a scratching, just they're kind of getting into it. And she says to her, her boy, oh, did you hear that? He's like, no, 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 it was nothing, it was just probably a squirrel. And it gets louder, and, and she's like, no, I, I really think we should be getting home, and he's like, no, no, I'm, I'm sure it was just nothing. And, and finally, she says, look, I want to go home. Take me home. I'm not in the mood anymore. He's like, right, right, right. So they drive away. And when he, he comes to, to her house, drop her off, he, he gets out to open the door. And there, stuck into the door, is a hook. And then he remembers that he heard on the radio earlier in the day about the, the, the insane serial killer who broke out the prison who had only a hook for a hand. This never happened. Serial killings like this kind of morphed into the urban legend, but if, if you look back, there's been stuff like this that existed for like, I would say, at least 100 years, maybe 150 years. The idea that if you're too young to be having sex, and you go off and have sex, something bad will happen to you. This is a moralistic parable. You'll get killed by the man with the hook. Slasher. Yeah. I was just going to say that slasher. Yeah, I, 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 you know, if you, if you've ever looked into some of the stuff about these, there was a really great documentary about slasher films and moralistic panic in the 80s. I can't, mind, I can't think of the name right now. Go look it up, it's really great. But it's this idea that, you know, these stories have been around since before our parents, and yet you guys still know the urban legend of the hook. And you're not, you're thinking of it, oh, it's, you know, it's just a scary campfire story, but it, well, it did carry a moralistic message. If you do the bad thing, if you step out of society's norms, something bad will happen to you, and it will be your fault, you deserve it. Um, Potentially, I saw it on Netflix like a long time ago, but talk to this guy afterwards, he's got the hookup. I just Googled.
Shh. He's got the hookup button. Now you're putting more work on me. So um, we're not going to be talking about gaming addiction, and here is why. Now, I'm aware of the fact that gaming addiction has recently been added to the DSM-5. Um, I have views on the DSM-5. Every social scientist you talk to will have their own views. Um, yeah, practice, as someone who will be doing mostly research in Europe, we use um, the ICD-10, soon to be the ICD-11, um, which is the World Health Organization's um, their diagnostic criteria. But the thing about gaming addiction, and I found, again, I found this image off through Google, and I really like it because the person right there is quite upset. They're in quite a lot of distress. But look at all the various ways that addiction is personified with, you know, two different kinds of alcohol, pills, cigarettes, um, looks maybe like something injectable like heroin, internet um, addiction. I don't know why weed is there, but we'll, we'll, give, it a, we'll give it a pass for now. Um, Self-harm, gaming. These are all things that cause what's called the dop dopaminergic response in the brain. That you are doing something, the brain is secreting dopamine. It goes through the reward pathway. Your brain is telling you, yes, yes. I like this, do more of this. And anything that you can get addicted to doesn't have to have addictive properties. Um, for example, we wouldn't say that self-harm would be the kind of thing that would have addictive properties, but if you're one of the people who utilizes that as a coping mechanism or in distress or because it causes a dopaminergic response, you could become addicted to that feeling. Some things do have chemical addictive properties, heroin, uh, nicotine, I can't go a morning without coffee, you know, caffeine, stuff like that. But I don't want to single out gaming addiction as being different from any other kind of addiction because as far as I'm concerned, it acts in the same way, uses the same mechanism as any kind of addiction. Now, addiction counselors and addiction specialists may disagree, <clears throat> excuse me, may disagree with me. And that's, that's perfectly cool, but for today, we're not going to be getting into it because it's not the kind of effect that we're discussing. So, so why is critical evaluation so important? Um, now, there's a little motto down there, don't defend crazy rats. And I want you to take the story and feel free to pass it along as your own if you want to impress people at cocktail parties or, you know, around gaming circles. Um, because a while back, my wife and my brother-in-law were having an argument about universal credit and or universal, uh, universal basic income. And my sister-in-law said, I, I read an article about that. She said, they did an experiment. My ear perked up. They did an experiment, right? They took rats, right? And they gave the rats everything that they would need, all the food that they would need, a place to live, everything was squiffy, everything was comfortable and lovely. And you know what happened by the third day? And I was like, what? She goes, the rats went mad. I was like, really? Their society broke down, all was crazy. And then a few years later, I was doing independent research and I came across the paper that likely led to the article and it was done in the 60s. And it was an experiment on overpopulation. And it's oftentimes called, if you want to look it up, the rat utopia experiment. I see a lot of people nodding, that's great. And your man, yeah, your man, well, I know, right? Your man basically, created a rat utopia, and after about 600 some days, the rats began displaying abnormal behavior due to overcrowding. But the cool thing was, the news article she read, which was attacking universal basic income, took this and reframed it in such a way that after three days of getting treats, all rats go mad. So, whenever you see a news story saying, they done a study, I'm gonna teach you how to do some critical evaluation so you're not defending crazy rats. So critical evaluation is so important because a lot of times authority, and that can be authority, the good guys or the bad guys, no matter politically where you stand, can use that to push an agenda. They done a study, so we should do X, Y, Z. Um, the, the, the plastic straw ban is a really, really good example of that because a lot of you know studies are showing well, there's too much plastic in the ocean, we have to do something. And then there was a need to reaction of ban plastic straws. Not the microplastics that are clogging up you know the food chain, not the tons and tons and tons of plastic fishing nets. We're gonna we're gonna ban plastic straws. We did something. So 
authority can be, like I said, the good guys or the bad guys, but then it, you also get this hijack by anti-vaxxers and climate change denialists and, and flat earthers who will say, one scientist did a study that agrees with me, so there you go. That that's the deal. This is this is science now. I'm going to ignore everything else, and I'm just going to focus on the science that I personally agree with. But the scientific method means accepting errors and correcting them. Um, I went to uh, the Human Behavior and Evolutionary Society's uh, yearly conference a few years back, and it was brilliant because one of the speakers was an incredibly, incredibly decorated academic. He did books, and papers, and did tenure, and all this stuff. And his whole entire talk, it was like an hour and a half talk, was all the research that he had done that was wrong. He did this landmark study that found this really, really amazing result. And it wasn't in my field, so I, I'm not gonna even try to, to quote what the research was about. But then he realized he'd made some major methodological errors. And this was a few years later, and he reran the study with correct methodology and he realized, oh, my first re my first results were, they were a product of, of type one and type two errors. He contacted the journal, the journal attracted the article. He said, but to this day, people are still citing that article even though he's retracted it. And he went through study by study. Here's what I did wrong in this one. Here's what I did wrong in that one. That's why we stress replication. If I can do it, I want to make sure that in the exact same condition, you can do it and you can do it and she can do it and he can do it. They can do it. Anyone can replicate that. That's how we get science. So here's a handy little workflow. You design your hypothesis, your research question. You say, what do I want to find out? You decide, how am I going to test this? You design your experiment. What properties am I going to hold constant? What properties am I going to control for? Who do I want to be involved in my study? You design your methodology. How exactly is this going to break down academically? You run your study. Do you take that data, you analyze that data, you write it up, you publish it, it goes through, like you were saying, the peer review process, where you fight with two people you've never met for about six months until they agree with you. Hopefully, other people can replicate that. After an upper replication, ta-da, science. That's why the theory of gravity is a pretty good theory. If you drop something, it falls. If you drop something in a black hole, but we still know, science says, if you drop something on Earth, gravity will pull it towards its center. So how do we study gaming effects? How do you quantify an effect? Is an effect after 45 minutes, 12 hours, 3 months, the rest of your lives? If you take a participant and have them play a game, are there any other variables you're controlling for? When, where, how are we testing? Are we testing in this person's living room? Or are we bringing them to a lab? Is it in the morning? Have they just got up? Is it in the middle of the night? Are they a night out? Who are our participants? How many of them? A lot of people say that, and I do tend to agree with this, after your participant group gets to 30, every single person in excess of 30 brings you closer to what's called the standard normal distribution which means that their results will have kind of the standard bell curve that you see with something like heights or weights or anything that's evenly distributed in the population. So if you have a sample size of two and you say, oh, these, these two kids play do and they beat the crap out of each other, yay, that's not exactly very sound science. So these are the questions that we ask, not only when we design studies, but when we critically evaluate them. So um, I just wanted an image of a professor talking, and Professor Oak really did kind of fit the theme. But the cool thing is that the professor that I had who first said this in my first year of undergrad, his eyebrows and hair are kind of the same. So <laughs> if you ever watch this, I'm sorry, Gary. Your eyebrows do look like that. But so he said, and this is one of the, the, one of the things that I have taken to heart in research, your data is only as good as the tools that you use, including your measurements. So how do we measure aggression? Another professor once, you know, said as we were talking about depression, and he said, look at the Beck's depression inventory. It's one of the most widely used ways that we can measure depression on someone. He goes, what does one point of depression mean? And we were like, hey. Uh -huh. He goes, the, what is the difference between scoring a seven and scoring an eight? How do you quantify one point of depression? And we were like, how do you? And he goes, you don't. Because what we do in the social sciences is we're taking abstract concepts and we're trying to kind of impose a system over them so we can study them. One point on the Beck's depression inventory means basically nothing to a person in distress who's suffering from clinical depression. So 
When we're measuring aggression, do we ask questions in a lab? How do we know that this tool, the scale that we use, is reliable? How do we know it's really measuring aggression? What about actual violent behavior? If you fill out an inventory and you say you feel more like you might punch someone who threatened you, does that mean that two days from now you're going to go into the 7-Eleven and punch someone you think is threatening you? Those aren't things that translate. And that's an important thing to remember. Uh, I was also keep it, also keep it consistent through all the tests too. Exactly. Well, you have a whole bunch of different effects. I really wanted to get into a lot of experimental design, but that's a whole other kettle of fish. But you do have things like regression to the mean, where if you test and retest people, they will the outliers will slowly start to come back into uh, into the mean of the bell curve. But when a story claims a new study says, when you see an article that says a new study says, look at the story. Does it actually link to the study? Click the link. Now, every scientific paper, or most of them, will have an abstract, and that's a really quick one paragraph summary of here's why we want to test this, here's what we're going to test, here's how we tested it, here's the results, here's what this implies. Read that. If you can, read the paper. Now, a lot of, a lot of journal articles are behind paywalls, and I will tell you, Google Sci-Hub, its extension changes every so often, but Sci-Hub is a really great way to take document inventory number, it's right there in the citation, Put that in there, it'll unlock the paper in PDF format for you. Because um, authors, when we publish papers, we don't make money off that. And uh, there's a lot of universities that are stopping working with some of these journals that insist on a paywall. So if you want to read, for example, okay, my paper's open access, but if you want to read someone's paper and it's got a paywall, use Sci-Hub. And you know what? If for some reason Sci-Hub can't load it for you, um, go to the university's website, contact the author. Because so many times, if you contact the author and say, I really want to read this paper, they'll email it to you. We don't make money off it, it's science. Go for it. So, when you're looking at the methodology, how many participants were in this? What are their demographics? Was this 17 kids in Canada? Was this a pool of 57 participants from Africa? One of the dirty secrets of the social sciences is that so much research concentrates on psych undergrads because we're right there. You know, you know what I'm talking about. We are right there. Do I feel depressed today? Yeah, I guess so. So look at who's being tested and how many people are being tested. How was the study conducted? What were the experimental conditions? Were they sequestered in a lab? Was this in the morning? Was this in the evening? Did they play the entirety of Dragon Age Inquisition? Did they play one mission from Fallout 3? And also, do the authors declare a conflict of interest? If, you're, if, if funding for your study is coming from a specific place, you must state that. Um, for example, if you are a member of the ESRB and you're getting money from the American government to conduct this study, you better be saying that conflict of interest. Um, I haven't done any funded research, so I haven't had the chance to be able to declare a conflict of interest, but all, all sound social scientists really should be declaring that. So look for that. Who's funding this and why? Unless they welcome it, someone else could... So in the social sciences, we do not make causal statements. A variable does not equal a result. We say that variables would have an association with, um, with the result, that they could be described as a in risk odds. We can't even say that smoking causes lung cancer. Do you know why? Because there is no conclusive proof that one person smokes one cigarette and will get lung cancer. People can get lung cancer from other, from other ways. There's you know, all sorts of genetics that factor into that. People could smoke their whole lives and never get lung cancer. What we say is there is a very strong positive association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And that's again one thing that one of my professors said that was so great. No matter how perfect the study, you could have scales, you, you could be measuring something on tools that were created by God. However, no matter how perfect your tools are, mathematically speaking, there will always be error. And I think that's, that's really beautiful as a social scientist. No matter how hard we try, no matter how perfect something is, we'll never know the actual truth. And I think that's kind of cool. Exactly. Um, when we say we have a, a statistically significant result, p-value is less than 0.5. Yes, statistical significance we can publish. 
all that means is the result's different from zero. It sounds really exciting when you say it in the paper, but all that means is it's not the result of chance. And publication bias makes all this worse. Publication bias means, okay, we didn't exactly get as statistically significant a result we wanted. Uh, we really can't get this published. So there's so much research that we tried this, and you know what? It didn't work out like we thought, but people don't publish that because that's not what journals want to publish. So a lot of times when you're doing research, you'll reach out, reach out to researchers and say, I read your three papers. They were really, really great. Do you have any unpublished studies that you'd be willing to share with me so you can get like a more complete picture? So like I said, there's an ongoing scientific debate when you look at these studies that, oh, they're, they're, they're saying that we had 30 kids and we exposed them to this video game and they were a little bit more violent afterwards. If there are positive results, there can be methodological flaws. If you get positive results but they have a very low impact, uh, the kids were a little teeny bit moderately more aggressive after five minutes of playing a video game. If your results are low compared with other violent media, yeah, we got a result, but it wasn't quite as serious as you know them sitting and watching the first three seasons of Oz or something like that. Also, results can vary by participant type. This brings in um, factors like um, personality and individual difference. If you have an individual who is aggressive and then you let them play and a, a violent video game, uh, you might find that yes, they are still aggressive. Um, there's also the fundamental error of what if you have a pool of people who by their participant type, they're more drawn to violent media because they're more violent people. And that was a failing of a lot of the early research, that no one decided to, to do any kind of personality inventories or any kind of baseline measure on their participants. You might find opposite results. I found a really great study from Japan where they had some school children playing a, a, a co-op shooter, and it actually increased pro-social behavior because they were using teamwork. You could get results that ignore other contributory factors. Uh, we're finding a, a lot of violence and a lot of aggression in uh, this specific subset. Okay, well, what's the socioeconomic status of this specific subset? What are uh, the health factors? What are the mental health factors that are going into your sample size? So if you're doing something, if you're doing a study that has a lot of factors and you're not controlling for the factors that you don't want to know about, that's a really big error. And the truth of it is, when we do a study, we really can't generalize those results past our participation, our participant pool. If I did a study with just you guys, and I got a result, I could say, in the sample of uh, individuals who came to Con Bravo and attended this study, I found X, Y, Z. I can't generalize that to the rest of the population as a whole. But enough of that. Let's talk about some really cool gaming research because we've got a little bit of time left. Um, this is just some stuff that's come across my dashboard in the past few years that I wanted to share because all of the research that I mean, I went on Google Scholar, Web of Science, um, Psych Info, and I found so much about gaming addiction and micro, uh, micro increases in aggression in specific populations. You guys know, or you wouldn't be here, that technology is great, gaming is fun, but gaming also has a lot of clinical implications that we can use to help people. And um, this picture was actually taken from a study that I found online. I have um, the one cited down there because um, I attended a presentation by a researcher at the University of Ulster, and I wasn't able to get in contact with her in time to, to cite her work, because it's, it's not been published yet, about um, adult, older adults using stuff like the Wii Fit board or other kind of balance technology to increase their balance. Because as you get older, you physically deteriorate, your balance deteriorates, and you'll, you'll be engaging in less physical activity. The less physical activity that you engage in, the more your, your, your physicality overall declines. And that has implications for your, your overall health and mental well-being and your, your, uh, your cognitive fitness as well. So there have been a lot of pilot studies using, like I said, we fit and other balance tech with elder adults to help them increase their balance. And the really cool thing is this can be done um, in a group. So it can be cognitively and socially stimulating as well. It can be done in the comfort of their home. And it's confidence boosting. As, again, as you enter your, your twilight years, you also enter a period of cognitive decline. But these are the kinds of things that are cognitively stimulating. They, they keep you interested. They keep you engaged. And a lot of the pilot studies yeah. have yeah. found I mean, that are, the elders are enjoying the balance uh, games more than, say, going to physiotherapy. It's fun. It's a game. It's something that you know they can do with their family. 
You know, it, they can involve other generations. So that's really, really cool. I want to share that with you guys. Um, this is a great study, uh, Schaefer 2012. And if you want my references, they're, they're at the end, or let me know, email them to you. Yeah, and this was on moral so choice research, and I really, really love moral choice in gaming. I think that's the coolest thing, super, super because I'll tell you what, uh, whenever I play whenever I play a video game, especially if it's a Western RPG, I'm the good guy. I'm the paladin. I'm the big, strong, beefy warrior with an impossibly large sword or gun on my back, and I'm going to charge in there, and I'm going to use my physical prowess to save all the people and do all the right things, because I can't do that in real life. I can't go down to the American border and beat people up and save refugees like I'd want to do. I can't see someone, you know, being the victim of, of a hate crime on the street, like, hey, don't you do that, let me tell you what. So I do that in video games. Now, I know other people who make different moral choices. Um, I played discussion. I, I killed all of the little sisters in Bioshock, so I'm the other side of it. Right. She's in the audience, but my better half likes to do all the immoral choices. For example, uh, one day I was working on a paper and she was playing Mafia 3 and said, Honey, look! And gunned down a whole bunch of people coming out of church. You are coming out of church. I said, oh, what does that say about you? Well, what she likes to do is she likes to kind of test the boundaries and see well, what happens if I make this, this immoral choice. So, in my defense, in the same game, I killed a bunch of KKK members. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably pretty much. It's, it's, ma it's mafia three. But, um, but I, I love looking into this. If you do a moral or immoral thing in a video game, that shouldn't translate to you are a moral or a moral person. So we had 83 participants here. They were college students. Their mean age was about, about 20 and a half years old. And they were randomly allocated to missions from Fallout 3 and the, uh, the No Russians mission uh, from oh, one of those shooters. Call of Duty 2. Thank you. Like I said, it's Shaver 2012. Seriously, look up this study. This was fantastic. And so about half of them, 41 uh, members of the study, expressed moral concern. They became morally activated, and they, they wanted to do the moral choice. The rest of them were morally disengaged, and these people fell into four main categories, what the research found. Uh, responsibility displacement. Oh, well, this is what I was told to do. This is what the game told me to do, so this is what I thought that I was supposed to do. Responsibility diffusion. Oh, well, the instructions were unclear, so I just did what I thought that I was supposed to do. It's just a game. And you know, I, I hear this a lot from people who want to test, especially in like Bioware RPGs and stuff like that, who want to test the boundary of the programming. Well, it's just a game. Let's see what happens. Let's see what they say if I do this. And uh, blame attribution. Again, I was just following orders. I thought this is what you, the researcher, wanted me to do. Here's the cool part about this. So we have um, morally activated versus morally disengaged and the good and the evil choice. So we have roughly almost a 60-40 split. So those who are morally activated, more of them made the good choice than made the evil choice. And those who are morally disengaged, more of them made the evil choice than the good choice. But here's the really cool part. None of that factored in to how much they enjoyed the game. That's why you have you have a, you have a significant result for a moral activation that that whether you were activated or dis, or engaged that led to that factored into your choice, but they still had equal enjoyment, and I think that's really cool that if you kill all the NPCs and you steal from everyone in Skyrim and you just <laughs> sleep with everyone and then let everyone down in Bioware RPGs, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person or you have latent bad person instincts. It can be for a variety of reasons, and a lot of them are just simply exploring the medium that you're enjoying. So tell someone that when they criticize you. <laughs> Except if you're my partner. It's also the purpose of the SRB. Aye. Aye. So this is, this is really cool. And um, so my, my supervisor at my PhD program, he's a psychosis researcher. And his driving ethos, he, the thing that, that, that he wants to know the most about is audiovisual hallucinations. That's just the idea of why this happens in the brain. It just captivates him. And he told me about the, the avatar VR therapy for people who are experiencing audiovisual hallucinations. And um, this has been around for a few years. There's actually a new pilot study that just started um, working with this. And basically, people who are experiencing overwhelmingly negative voices, 
will sit down with the therapist and the software and they design the avatar, they design how they feel that the voice that speaks to them would look. They're actually able to, to, to tweak the voice, higher, lower pitched, what's the tone, so it would be roughly similar. Yeah. And then they're in one room, interacting with the avatar. The therapist goes into another room. Now the therapist has the ability to speak as the avatar and to also speak as the therapist. And so over these sessions, the voice turns from quite abusive to being quite supportive. And then the therapist is kind of there as a third wheel. Now the example that was um, uh, published in uh, The One Left at All uh, 2013 was someone whose, um, whose negative voice kind of was a bully of theirs from high school. And this is a fact they only really realized this when they were designing the avatar. And this is, you're, you're, you're a loser, and then and no, no, one, no one loves you, and you'll never, you'll never be anything, you'll always be a failure. And then the therapist says, do you think that's true? And then the participant says, oh, it must be true. And, and the voice says, yes, of course it's true. And the therapist says, I don't really think that that represents you. And then the voice says, well, do you think that I'm right? And the participant says, well, well, I'm not sure. And it was a really great series of transcripts as the abusive voice slowly became more and more supportive over the course of the therapy to finally making statements like, I think that I, I think that I mistook you at first. I thought that you were a pushover and a loser, but now I can see that you're not. Now I can see you're not someone who would deserve my abuse. And the really great part is this is working to decrease overall distress and to increase well-being. With, with psychosis, with um, the symptoms of psychosis, especially audiovisual hallucinations, distress is the main driving factor that can make someone's mental well-being kind of start to fall apart. Um, my supervisor and I, uh, we did a study, um, and if you're interested, I can, I can uh, direct you to it through Google, where we took about 150 people who had talked about their first episode psychosis, and a lot of, a lot of people had espoused, they had heard, uh, they had audio hallucinations in childhood, but they assumed that this was just something that everyone experienced. Everyone had voices in their head. And it wasn't until they got older, they became adolescents, and their symptoms began to evolve when they started to feel distress. And that is when the, uh, they, became, they went into a psychotic state. And so people who are dealing with mental illnesses, a lot of times we can't just you know, say, here's a great pill or do this thing and you'll be completely cured. A lot of it clinically is about management. So this is a really great way to, to take something that's quite upsetting, the experience of, of audio hallucinations, and try to reduce the distress, try to make that manageable. And I'm going to be following the pilot study when they, they publish the results, because this sounds like really, really great. And the fact that participants can control the experiment, they can kind of escape out of it. There's a, a panic button they can press, and the screen goes to like a, a I think it's like a tropical scene, and there's quite soothing music plays if it's just becoming too overwhelming, but really, really cool stuff. Um, other things like adaptive gaming, and I think uh, Silent Hill was one of the most prominent uh, games to adapt to player reactions. And adaptive gaming uh, is not as new as we think. I mean, if you have any kind of operating system that allows you user settings, that's kind of, not, not an AI, but that's the system adapting to your preferences. And adaptive gaming can increase user immersion. It's kind of like it's using a personality inventory to profile you. It's got like it's got like a little set of algorithms. If you do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Um, oh, a word on personality inventories. Who believes in the Myers-Briggs? <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Personality inventories um, are really great ways to try to uh, impose order over an abstract concept, but don't believe in the Myers-Briggs. A, a lot of employers pay good money every year to be able to, uh, to give the Myers-Briggs to people, but it's, it's not very reliable. But those are the kind of scales and measures that underlie the programming. Uh, you know, so if you, again, like if you make certain choices, if you have certain ways of doing things, the, the, the game will adapt to you. But not all programming motives are pure, and this is becoming really, really, really a hot topic right now. Uh, who watches Jim Sterling? Yes. I can't say AAA video games now, but I'm like, AAA video games! But, I feel like um, a lot of a lot of video game companies are trying to hijack the social sciences and use the research that we do with gaming to make more money out of people. I said that we weren't really going to talk about gaming addiction as a, as a separate function, separate from addiction, but we know that a lot of companies do try to take use these adaptive systems to take advantage of people who might be who might have addictive personalities or be prone to addiction to, to make money off them. So. 
the motives here are not always um, user enjoyment. But these adaptive games do have clinical applications. Now I told you, I started at the beginning of uh, the lecture talking about me back in the ancient days of being 14 in 1994, and playing Doom 2, and uh, you can tell I'm short. I'm almost middle-aged, I'm still short. I was not a tall person. I was not exactly somebody who would be immune to bullying in high school. And I have memories of coming home, putting Doom 2 on the computer. We didn't have, it didn't have a built-in uh, music drive, so I had a President of the United States of America, the first album, on the boombox <laughs> under the computer, putting that on, warping to the last level, clipping into the wall, letting it fill up with, with demons, and then going nuclear with the, with the BFG. And that's how you know I would I would kind of displace these feelings of oh I've been bullied and oh, I'm angry. But then sometimes I used to play a game called Geo Hunt, and Geo Hunt was a CD-ROM game. It was a children's game that was educational. There was questions on like you know, history and science and all this other kind of stuff. And it had been purchased from my sister, but it was voiced by a jazz musician, and he had a beautiful voice, like really deep, really smooth, really comforting. And you put your name in, and it would it, it was adapted. It would call you by name, so I'd be like. Hello, Amanda. I'm so glad you came back. Thanks. It was for a game for kids. I knew all the answers, but it was like, oh, you got that. I knew that you could do it. Do you want to do another quiz? Oh, wow, you're really good at this. And it was the stupidest, stupidest thing, but it really raised my self-efficacy. So I had these two reactions. I could, I, I could take this aggressive action. I could go in there and I could blow demons so they exploded in blue blood. Or I can hear man saying, you're so awesome. Like, yes, I am. So they have these clinical applications that whatever you need, you can probably find a game that, that fits that. I know a lot of people feel very strongly about Undertale. I haven't played it yet. It's one of those things, when I finish the PhD, I'm going to get to. But so many people have said so much about how much, how salient this game is, how meaningful it is. How much the, they were in a really dark place, and they played Undertale, or they played, you know, something like a Dragon Age Inquisition, or they played Skyrim, or someone who had a disability, and they said, "I played this, and I felt powerful." And you look at the people, like I said at the beginning of the lecture, who were just saying, "This is terrible. This is horrible. This will make you aggressive," and then all the testimonials of people who have had experiences with technology, experiences with video games, and have been changed for the better, even if it's something as silly as a little kid coming home from school who's been bullied and wants to feel better. And that is why I will always, as, as an evolutionary psychologist, I will always champion technology as being good for us because it's adapting to us. We're adapting to it. We're, we're post-evolution as a species. We don't let the environment control our adaptation anymore. We control the environment. And we're the first species technically so far that we have we have evidence of that's been able to do that and that's amazing so in conclusion the effects of gaming are difficult to describe and to test there's conflict of interest and there are a lot of agendas out there i know now trump is getting involved in it and that can go nowhere good but a lot of countries yeah, do let cooler heads prevail. Right. They'll say, you know what, we're not going to have loot boxes, we're not going to have gambling, we don't believe that games are bad, they just knock that stuff out. Critical evaluation of gaming research can help separate the science from the sludge, so always, always, always dig into stuff. One thing I wanted to, uh, to see if I had time to mention, I know a lot of people just heard about uh, in the last uh, year or two, there was a very, very, very flawed study uh, claiming uh, a new diagnosis called rapid onset gender dysphoria that was torn apart academically once it was revealed that there were a lot of agendas in the mix. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, there was a really great paper done. I forget the name of the author, um, but uh, they were at Brown University. So see if you, you can Google that. Completely destroying this paper from a methodological standpoint, not even touching the politics involved, just saying, you can't scientifically make these claims, and here's why. So when you have that ability to stop, look at something critically, you're not the kind of person who's going to be taken in when your hairdresser says, well, you know the earth's flat, right? They've done a study. So there's also a lot of research applications for video games and gaming with a lot of beneficial outcomes. But I don't have to tell you guys that. You're here because you love gaming and because you understand the value of gaming. So we have a few minutes left. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Um, do you believe, uh, believe the moral panics and the, uh, and the fear of technology has to do with uh, 
how far a person has progressed and how much neuroplasticity they have lost? I never considered that. So you would say that their reaction to it wouldn't be a function of culture or experience. It would be a function of the fact that they lack the... the at, yeah, at, they're, they're at a point divorced from cognitive maturity that they just can't accept that? <laughs> well, I think culture and you know, yeah. environment people play a part. That's but right. I do that's, think it does something. But that's, that's really like interesting. Like you were saying, the little kids are. Yeah. And you're, but adults would, would lack a neuroplastic. That I've never thought of that. Yeah. I, I want to dig into that because that, that's a pretty sound hypothesis. I used to work in a retirement home. Oh, nice. And uh, you raise an excellent point because. I don't know cause and effect, you can't necessarily yeah. say which is which, but the residents who would play Sudoku tended to be readier to adapt to changes in their social environment than the ones who kind of introverted and would not participate in games. Well, there is um, another thing I wanted to talk about if I had time. Um, there is a really great theory, and I, I can't think of the name of the researcher, but he's out of the University of Chicago, who has a theory of a cognitive buffer against dementia and Alzheimer's. And what his research is showing from like a lot of people who have donated their time and eventually um, their brains for examination after death, is that a lot of us will suffer symptoms of dementia and Alzheimer's, but have such a strong kind of cognitive buffer there that we would pass away from uh, either uh, elder disease or natural causes before we would begin to suffer that. So that would, yeah, that would directly play into that. That's really interesting. I want to I do some Googling later when I get Wi-Fi back, because I, I want to see if anyone's done any research on it, because that, that's, that's a great hypothesis. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Yes. It might be a little bit out of topic, but since you said you're a scholar, I was I was just uh, curious. So what was that? So talking about the moral concern. Yeah. So in terms of, do you think it? Do you think or is there kind of study that it more depends on people's nature or nature? So, I mean, something that you are born or something you have learned. So which part is uh, more effective of that kind of thing? Well, the thing about moral panic is a lot of your values factor into it. And your values are their experiences that are kind of trained up with you. However, there's always that genetic component. There's always what your brain is, what, it has your, what your brain has the potential to be based on your experiences. And not everyone that's raised with a very strong moral culture goes on to perpetuate that moral culture. So I think that would, yes. Like me. I don't know what, you know, what your personal circumstances are, but yeah, like a lot of us turn to our culture and say, you know what, that's just based on my experiences, based on who I am, I can't espouse that. And I, that definitely would be a factor. So it looks like we are just about out of time. So thanks for coming, anyone. Here are the references. If you want any of this information, if you want to copy these slides, just come find me on social media. I'll be glad to like drop box it to you, anything like that. So um, if you want to follow me on, on Twitter, I'm at the Omega Geek. So thanks for coming. I hope you learned something today. Thank you to the following patrons with an especial thank you to Ed Pelnick, G Viral, Justin Ball, Nate Watson, and Sally Zybert.